we are at the end of our unit on China, and the last event that we look at is Tiananmen in 1989. This is the most iconic photograph from that event, and it's called Tank Man. And you can see the worker in the front here who is standing in front of a row of tanks. And I want to show you uh, some of that raw footage from that event. It's just a couple of minutes long. Okay, so uh, that's just a brief video of what happened, part of what happened in Tiananmen 1989. Uh, this is often called the Tiananmen Square Massacre uh, or the Tiananmen Uprising. I don't like the term Tiananmen Square Massacre, and I'll explain why later, but this is one of the most controversial and uh, misunderstood events that happened in China at the, towards the end of the 20th century. So we're going to look at that today. Um, the order of operations here, we will look at uh, some of the good things that Deng Xiaoping did until this event really marred his uh, record. And then um, we'll look at the source I wanted you to read for Tiananmen. Deng Xiaoping was in charge uh, during this time period, so he often um, takes a lot of the blame for Tiananmen. But he did do some good things, and I want to highlight some of those now. Uh, the most important things are foreign policy and economic policy. So I'll go through foreign policy first. Uh, he was able to renegotiate with the British to get Hong Kong back as a part of China. So that was a huge step uh, for the Chinese government. Um, he reestablished relationships with Moscow. Remember that Mao didn't have the best relationship with Stalin, and then Stalin died. And Mao really hoped he would become the leader of communism worldwide, 
and that did not happen. And so Mao didn't have the best relationship with the Soviet Union, and part of the reason that Mao met up with Nixon in 1972 was because he thought the Soviet Union was more of a threat than the United States. Um, and along that same line, although Mao initiated that contact between China and the United States, relation, normalizing relations between the U.S. and China took place under Deng Xiaoping's watch. So that's why he's credited with normalizing relations with the U.S. In terms of economic policy, this is huge. Deng Xiaoping believed that Chinese entrepreneurs should be able to use their creativity to try to help the economy and have their own businesses and generate some profit. And this really moved China away from traditional communism. Uh, Deng Xiaoping called this socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, so this is a vast departure from traditional communism. If Mao had been alive, he probably would have hated this. I'm pretty sure he would have hated this. But again, he and Deng Xiaoping didn't get along so much towards the end anyway. Um, if Deng Xiaoping had died before Tiananmen, he would have been remembered as a great hero. All of these things would have been on his record as being great and wonderful. But um, he, did not, he did not die before Tiananmen. He was still in charge during Tiananmen, and so uh, there were some problems uh, that certainly affected how people remember Deng Xiaoping even to today. Um, I mentioned before that there was social unrest within China, and you have the biggest example of that is the, the, the Democracy Wall Movement in 1979 to 81. At first, Deng Xiaoping thought this was okay, allowing people to air their grievances and just talk about what was bothering them, but then he thought it was dangerous. So initially he thought it was okay, then he thought it was dangerous, and he opposed it, and he didn't want uh, all these young people to be having this forum where they could vocalize their uh, problems with the government. So Democracy Wall, remember we talked about Wei Jingsheng, and uh, he was talking about the, the fifth modernization, democracy, uh, and that was a threat to Deng Xiaoping. So, just to give you some context, the students, uh, the, the uh, democracy wall went away in 1981, but the protesting, the students arguing or talking about, debating what was the problem, what are the problems with China, did not go away. And so, uh, in the mid to late parts of the 1980s, the students began to protest, and there was a leader. Um, a Chinese communist leader at that time, Hui Aobang, who was, I'll show you his picture in a second, he, it was his job to stop these protests and you know, clamp down on these protesters. And Hui Aobang did not do that. He was uh, more supportive of the students, allowing them to air their grievances. Um, so he was uh, more supportive of the students and the students liked him. Well, then he died. So in April 1989, he died. Uh, the students had already been planning to stage more protests on May 4th, which would have been the 70th anniversary of the May 4th movement in 1919 after the Paris Peace Conference. But he died in April, so boom, they started the protests at that time. Because he was an official in the Communist Party, his funeral was open to the masses, and the students decided to use that as an opportunity in, in Beijing to stage more protests. Um, Chinese workers joined the protests, so people often think this was a student protest. It started out as a student protest, but other groups joined, and workers certainly joined very soon after it began. So don't discount that. And then uh, we have what's called the June 4th Massacre, where uh, a lot of the bloodshed took place um, in, in Tiananmen um, in 1989. So let's just show you some pictures here. So you can see the uh, students are on one side. Along with workers, there are workers in this crowd. It's not just students. But you can see younger individuals here. And on one side, the other side is the military. And they are making sure the students don't do anything they're not supposed to do. 
the protests started out fairly peacefully, but they escalated uh, on, on June the 4th. I like to show this picture because um, it has an interesting quote that I will translate for you. It says, democracy is the foundation for building the country. Bureaucrats are the roots of corruption. That sounds a lot like Wei Jingsheng talking about democracy and the fifth modernization, that we need democracy in order to move the country forward. But I want to make this very clear. The protesters weren't really protesting in favor of democracy. It wasn't like they were clamoring for more democracy within China. What they were really protesting against was all the corruption that they saw. The Communist Party officials were benefiting from uh, their corrupt policies. Their children were benefiting. And a lot of these, initially the students, were very upset. They could see the inequality and they didn't like it. So even though they talk about even to this day, uh, participants in the Tiananmen Uprising will talk about their fight for democracy. It wasn't so much a fight for elections. It wasn't so much a fight for that. It was a fight for uh, stopping corruption within the Chinese government. I don't like saying Tiananmen Square Massacre because a lot of the violence took place outside of the square. This number one is the square. So this is Tiananmen Square right here. And a lot of the violence took place in the surrounding roads. A lot of the violence took place around the square, not inside the square. So I don't like saying Tiananmen Square Massacre. And this is the most iconic image, Tank Man. But it wasn't uh, just this one person against tanks. A lot of other violence took place as well. There is another video on Canvas that I encourage you all to look at. I don't have time to show it to you now, but if you let me pause that. If you go to Canvas and you can scroll down to the Tiananmen. I have different videos on Tiananmen there, which is nice. Um, but this one at the very bottom, the amazing story behind that photo, the photographer, uh, Jeff Widener, talks about taking this photo. He talks about other photos that he took during that tumultuous period in 1989. Uh, so just make sure you're aware of that. But the Tiananmen Uprising uh, was very peaceful at first, and then it became became very violent uh, with the uh, military shooting into crowds, um, driving tanks into crowds, killing people, um, a lot of bloodshed. And one of the leaders of that student protest movement was Chai Ling, who is seen here uh, at the time when she was 23 years old during the uprising, speaking into a microphone. Um, she is still alive uh, in 2017, still alive. She lives in the United States. Uh, she has become an author as well as she has her own nonprofit and other organizations that she works with. Um, and the book here, you can see it. I got to move my head again. The book here is called A Heart for Freedom. It's her memoirs. She started writing at the time of the protests, but the book didn't actually appear until 2011. And you notice at the very bottom of the book cover is Tank Man. The photo is Tank Man there. So. Um, a Heart for Freedom. Um, when you look at that particular document from Chai Ling, uh, what's her attitude toward the protests, toward democracy? Why is this cause so important to her? Do you agree or disagree with her decision to flee? She lives in the United States today and um, has uh, done a lot with her organizations over time. Um, place this event within a broader context. So why did these protests, why did this violence erupt when it did in 1989? So that's all I've got, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the end of our China unit, and so we do have our final assessment for this unit uh, coming up. So check the announcements online to make sure you know what's coming up there. So I want to make sure you understand this unit, and I want you to be able to connect some of the events we studied with a current event. So I want to make sure you do that as well. Um, but like I said, that's all I've got, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this unit on China. We're moving on to Japan. And so I look forward to talking with you about all that. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.